Okay, good to go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Debbie Coates, and I'm the president of Refit, and thank you all for coming this morning to Refit's 30th breakfast at the New York State School Board Association Convention. First, I'd like to thank Kendra McFulton from ECG Engineering for co-sponsoring and helping to sponsor part of our breakfast today. Kendra, please stand. I'd also like to take a second to thank our Helen Maloney, who's our Executive Secretary for Refit. I'd like to introduce a couple of people in the room. First, we have uh, two of our speakers, Bob Lowry from the uh, uh, State Superintendent's Association. <laughs> Dr. Rick Timms, who is also a speaker here this morning. <laughs> Susan Bertram, who is our Area 11 Director, Second Vice President of New York State School Board, and more importantly, she is our, my colleague on Nassau Post. to our children. 
Over the past two years, refit members and refit eligible districts, those are districts with a combined wealth ratio of 1.5 or less, have lost more than 1,400 teacher and administrative positions. We have excess more than 800 individuals, casting them off into the abyss of unemployment. As a result, our class sizes have increased, our instructional program offerings continue to be reduced, opportunities for career and technical education continue in a downward spiral, and extracurricular activities have been marginalized before and after school programs are disappearing. And yet, and yet the state continues to abandon our students' basic academic needs while chasing their nickels with our dollars for such black hole programs, unfunded programs as APPR. All students in every county, city, town, and village are entitled to enter school prepared physically, intellectually, emotionally, and socially to receive a sound basic education. A child's right to an education should not ride on the political waves of the polluted waters known as state politics. Public education is a civil right that cannot be dictated or determined by the property value behind each student. This country, more than 100 years ago, closed the door on the issue that believed people were property. We need to work with all the stakeholders inside and outside the educational community throughout the state in order to develop the capacity necessary in providing a sound basic education for all. Finally, let's give our children the same resources that the state provides to those incarcerated so that the students of today will not become the incarcerated of tomorrow. Moving on, we will have the opportunity to ask questions at the conclusion of both presentations. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Bob Larry. Good morning, and thank you for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you, although I have to say that these last couple of days, I wondered, where's Howard? I, I do miss seeing your, uh, your former colleague and, and executive director. Um, I, I kind of feel like uh, part of the introduction should have been something like appearing on a stage together for the first time anywhere while uh, we were kids. And uh, there's a reason why I make a point of saying that. Um, we're a few years apart in age, I won't say which is older, which of us is older, but we actually grew up about three miles apart in a part of the city of Niagara Falls called LaSalle. And uh, I retain intense affection for Western New York. I've lived in the capital region for more than half my life, but I still consider that part of the state home. But I tell my kids Niagara Falls is a good place to be from. And I mean that in two ways. One is it was a great place to grow up. Diverse people living there, hardworking uh, people. Uh, but it's also now one of the absolute poorest districts in the state. But if you look at the percentage of kids in poverty or the ability to pay for education out of local sources. So that is where my heart is still. I have the duty of representing and working for all the districts in the state. But, uh, but as I say, that's, that's where my heart is. I live in uh, a district that is on the front page of every school aid run. It's the third district in the state. So I can't avoid looking at it at first, but then I turn to, uh, to Niagara Falls. Um, I appreciate Bob's uh, reference to football in his introduction. I sometimes use a football analogy in my, uh, in talking, describing how we approach advocacy. And, uh, you know, being a transplant in Western New Yorker, I'm a long-suffering Buffalo Bills fan, so I, I, I use Jim Kelly, their great quarterback of their Super Bowl years, but we use Eli Manning as well. You put 11 Jim Kellys or 11 uh, uh, Eli Mannings on the field, they were great quarterbacks, but you lose every game. You need different players to do different things. And part of what we as the council try to do in the world of advocacy is be the people who present the facts. Rick says things that I don't feel comfortable saying, partly because superintendents are visible and vulnerable, as we saw the year before last. So we try very hard to be the people who present the facts, and that's part of what, what I'll do uh, today. Bob said, uh, let's hold questions till the end, but I'll ask you uh, a question. How do you interpret these, uh, these numbers? The top, the governor's overall approval rating, we all hear about it, 70% favorable, so forth. 
But you know, if you look at his, his approval ratings on education, they're 20 points or so low, 20, 25 points. Any speculation why that might be? Well, when I, uh, when I look at this, when friends from NICE or the Alliance for Quality Education, our presumption is uh, people are concerned about what they see happening in their schools because of budget cuts, teacher layoffs, bigger class sizes, kids not getting picked up by the bus in front of their house, so forth and so on. But this, uh, this summer, I had the experience of teaching a, a course in education policy and politics for Buffalo public school teachers, mostly online. And I asked them, how do you interpret this? I should get a segment on public opinion. Partly showed them how miserable public opinion of teacher unions is. But I asked them how they interpret this, and I was surprised by their reaction. They said, we think, almost well, unanimously, we think people are concerned about the quality of what they see happening in the schools, and they're disappointed the government hasn't done more about it. I, bring, I start off with this because I think either interpretation, it's not good for the governor. And part of what I think about all these issues that we're wrestling is he owns these problems, not because he created them, maybe he contributed to them, you know, with the tax gap, but I, I, again, I would be the guy who presented some facts. And I had the, I had the experience of working for his father. Uh, and that experience, just working for a governor in tough times, forget the, the family connection, gives me a lot of sympathy for governors. We had two tough years before he became governor, and then he walks in inheriting a $10 billion deficit that he had a constitutional duty to close. So I'm willing to, to give him a pass um, uh, three years uh, up until this current year. And then this year, he supported a tax reform package that provided the additional revenue to uh, make a school aid increase possible this year. Uh, but whether he likes it or not, whether it's fair or not, people expect governors to solve problems. And, uh, and so I think that this is something that is going to become more and more of a factor going forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. A little bit of background about uh, state uh, finances. Something the state does well and does better now is putting out information about its, its finances. Yesterday, the state comptroller put out uh, what they call the monthly cash report for September. Uh, every quarter, the governor's budget has been asked to do an update on the state financial plan. The next one is due any day. I checked actually last night to see whether the, the latest one is proposed to the so called media report. Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, across the top, you see the projected deficits going forward. Uh, second line shows what those deficits would be as a percentage of expenditures. $982 million next year. I won't be surprised if in your update uh, that comes out in a couple of days, uh, if that number is bigger. But I don't recall the last time we had a projected deficit below a billion dollars. Uh, you can see projected school aid increases. In order to come up with these bottom line estimates, they have to estimate everything in the budget. You know, every revenue source, every expenditure item, and also the percent changes. This school aid figure, that reflects uh, the new personal income growth cap on school aid, linking future growth in school aid to year-to-year -year changes in the personal income of New York State taxpayers. Um, I note that there are, there's, there are rumors that the actual figure will come in about a half a point lower, 3% rather than 3.5%. That would suggest rather than a $712 million increase, a $600 million increase. Some observations. The governor has to propose a balanced budget. The Constitution says so. He can't run a deficit like, like they do in Washington. Uh, there are risks to the forecasts. Our revenues have come in lower than anticipated. Uh, but we also benefited from a one-time settlement. Uh, so right now we're still in a surplus position. Funding, the spending picture is unclear because we've had some things uh, both uh, arrive earlier and later than anticipated. I'll talk a little bit more about the federal issue. Uh, there are always risks from federal audits and litigation. There's been news in the paper recently about, uh, frankly, Republicans in Congress agitating to have the Federal Health and Human Services Department go for York State for some overclaiming Medicaid, not in the schools. Uh, 
I mentioned about the uh, school aid growth cap. We talk about it, I talk about it as a cap, but this year I think it also functioned as a bit of a floor because again, the governor supported that tax reform package in order to enable the state to follow through on the, the expectation of an $805 million increase. Uh, having said that, no individual district can count on a specific percentage increase. That remains to be negotiated. Um, and not just how it gets allocated among districts, but also how it gets allocated among categories is a key fact. Uh, last year, we benefited from uh, unusually low growth in the expense base aid, building posts, transportation aid. Whether that continues uh, remains to be seen, but that meant there was kind of more space within the cap to provide a general aid increase. There are varying debates over how much the competitive grant programs that the governor has favored should grow under current law. I think the regions will say, let's take a vacation from increasing funding from those for those things. Found find general aid, uh, increase foundation aid, or reduce the gap elimination adjustment. You can get into heated arguments over that. I think it's really like kind of arguing over whether the money comes in a brown envelope or a white envelope. It's not what it's called, it's how the formula is calculated to distribute that, that, that matters. Uh, federal picture, hear a bit about sequestration. If Congress and the President don't agree to a deficit reduction plan over in the uh, next few months after the election, uh, automatic cuts would, uh, would go into effect designed to save $1.2 billion over 10 years uh, in education. The uh, first year impact nationwide, you can see what they're expected to be. Actually, there's an expectation that instead of a 7.8% cut, it could be over 9%. But at the 7.8% level, those are the figures. Rule, you could apply that percent against what your district receives in terms of the state of, as a whole. I figure the state generally gets around 7% of, of federal spending. So $1.1 billion, and that'd be $77 million. That's in the first year. It would not affect current year funding. They would not be mid-year cuts. They would hit first in 2013-14 for the most part. Impact aid for districts that have federal military facilities uh, would have more immediate cuts. Uh, you can see the other estimates there. You know, in addition to direct cuts to districts, to education funding, we need to be concerned about the impact on the total state budget. If there were cuts to how much the state gets from the federal government to pay for Medicaid, that might force the government and the legislature to look for other ways to save money in, in the state budget to offset the impact of, of those, uh, those cuts. And I worry about what might happen to the state education department because they're now down to like 8% funding uh, from uh, state tax dollars. And that's all about sequestration. That's you know what happens if they don't reach agreement. Even if they reach agreement, we could have uh, you know, equally bad uh, bad consequences, or, or perhaps even worse. Just a little bit about uh, state aid. The bars on the red, the red bars that uh, veer off to the left, those show the 2011-12 gap elimination adjustment per pupil districts grouped by property wealth per pupil, from poorest to richest, um, and then the uh, the the blue-gray lines to the right, those are the increases in this year's budget in general purpose aid. Uh, the dark blue is what the governor proposed, the gray is what the legislature added. Three things about this chart. One is the cuts were not progressive. You can see the poor districts generally took larger, larger cuts. That got a lot of attention. Um, the, the lines to the, uh, the uh, right, the segments to the right, those are more progressive. Uh, I think that the governor and the legislature did respond to the advocacy of people like Rick and Refit and, and so forth. Uh, but final point is those bars to the right are pretty puny compared to the bars to the left. I just calculated 83 percent of the districts in the state get less aid than they did in 2008-9. And if we cut out building aid, we might be able to count on our fingers and toes the numbers of districts that, that are still getting more aid than they were four years ago. While we've been here, we got a bit of a jolt from the teacher's retirement system, not to be spreading more bad news. Superintendents I've talked to are aware of this, I'm not sure about board members. 
Um, I had heard that we were in for another big jump in TRS costs, but I hadn't heard anything for a few months. So I was maybe getting a bit of, get a, getting a bit hopeful. But on Thursday, TRS sent out a bulletin saying they expect the contribution rate for 2013-14 to be between 15 and a half and 16 and a half percent, 3.5 to 4.5 points higher. Part of what I do is talk to politicians and the media and other folks about all this stuff, and I appreciate that school finance seems like an intimidating topic, so I, I think, how can I explain this simply? And one is, it's like, this is like being told you have to give everyone you know, a three and a half percent to four and a half percent raise because contribution rates apply against the payroll. On top of whatever raise uh, you get, and I can imagine some conversations back in districts between superintendents and union presidents saying, you want your, know where your raise is? It's going to TRS. Uh, two, out of, two out of the last three years, we estimated that pension and health insurance costs would have driven up school spending by two and a half percent uh, even if everything else could have been frozen. And actual spending increases were below 2%, so it said districts were cutting other things to absorb those costs. Um, this current year, we had a bit of a break because TRS didn't grow as much, but for the coming year, we again would estimate this 2.5% increase. I'd also say another way of thinking about this is just the growth in TRS costs is likely to be greater than what we get from a 3% school rate increase. Some other issues, mandate relief. Uh, we have a state mandate relief council. Uh, unlike prior incarnations, this is comprised entirely of state officials. I think that's a good thing because this is a group that has legal authority to actually overrule state agency decisions on getting relief from mandate, re uh, from mandate requirements. Uh, and I also think maybe it raises expectations. Eventually, I think the media is gonna say, what is this thing doing? When are you going to propose a mandate relief? If you've been paying attention to the news, you're aware that at the beginning of last week, the governor uh, expressed some agitation with counties and cities for asking for mandate relief, basically saying, you're on your own. Do what I do. Uh, you know, negotiate with your unions and so forth. And you know, I can offer some arguments and, and why it's not as easy for school districts. One thing, you know, in their negotiations, they use uh, promises of no layoffs, qualified promises, and furloughs. Schools can't use furloughs. Yeah? We gotta have somebody stand in front of the kids every day and someone driving the bus every day. So it's not as easy for school districts as it might be for the, the governor. And I'd also say, you know, even if we can balance our books, is that the optimal result? Wouldn't it make more sense to change the rules so that we can get more mileage out of the resources that, uh, that the taxpayers give us? Oh, on the uh, the governor's uh, Education Reform Commission. You know, you've heard about it. I was impressed by the turnout for the Long Island hearing. Uh, I think it was the largest audience for any, probably the largest number of witnesses who signed up. Um, what we are hearing is that they are looking for, in December, a handful of, quote, doable items. So we're not expecting big ideas. Uh, maybe that'll change. Uh, but uh, we were hearing of things like authorizing regional high schools as an example of a, of a doable item. Uh, next week we uh, are planning to release a survey that we did. We did a survey last summer, 2011. We repeated it this year. Last year we got some good attention. The Albany Times Union said everyone should read the report. Hope to repeat, uh, hope we'll get some similar reactions this year. When you look at some of the questions we asked last year, I can imagine a reporter saying, oh, things are getting better. Last year, you said you were eliminating 4.9% of your jobs. This year, you're only eliminating 3.9%. Things are getting better. Well, no, we've eliminated 8% of our jobs in two years. Uh, that's what the, uh, the graph in the, the upper uh, uh, right left-hand corner is. Bottom corner, it's percentage of superintendents who said their district's fiscal condition was worse than the year before. But we also added some questions this year about insolvency. And last year, I think, you know, one of the things that came through was that whatever people thought about that year, they were really alarmed about the future. 89% of superintendents last year said they were worried about their district's reliance on reserves. This year, we asked about insolvency. It's been in the news a lot. 
And the way we framed it was, uh, if you foresee a point which your district would be unable to uh, ensure that some of its financial obligations will ever be paid, capital letters forever, so that we make sure this isn't just a one month cash flow problem. And you can see the results there. 9% within two years, ultimately 77% of students, or 70, uh, yeah, 77 of students said they could foresee it happening at some point. I'm not sure I want to cite that latter number or draw much attention to because I imagine some folks might say, well, that tells us that all the superintendents and board members and the business officials are don't know what they're doing. Uh, but, uh, you know, the numbers are alarming. 9% that would be 60 districts a few weeks ago. The business officials came out with a report saying 215 districts were on track to exhaust all their savings. I'd explain the difference by saying, it's like they said 215 cars are headed for a cliff. Well, the drivers in the cars don't want to go off the cliff. They'll stop on the brakes, they'll let up on the gas, they'll turn the steering wheel. So, having done all that, we're saying that maybe 60, 60 districts could be going off a cliff in two years. Other thing, we also asked about educational insolvency. That's something that in the last couple of years has emerged. Yes, we can remain financially solvent, continue to keep the doors open, but we're not going to be able to offer the kids what they deserve. And uh, there you can see the results. 19% uh, within two years, 50%, 51% within four years. Last, uh, last thing I'll share from the survey is one of the questions, the question we added last year, right at the very end, was which is the greater concern for your district, the tax cap or possible state aid levels? And I was really impressed by the results. If you looked at the top line, it looked like people were equally concerned. 25% uh, tax cap, 23% state aid, 52% equal concern. But when you looked across the regions, um, you saw huge variations. Poor upstate regions, much more concerned about state aid. What we see this year is across almost all regions, except for Long Island, about a 20 point shift towards state aid is the bigger concern. For whatever reason, Long Island, the numbers are pretty stable. But lower Hudson Valley, the most affluent part of the state, Westchester, Rock, and Putnam, uh, identifying the tax gap is a big concern, dropped from 65% to 22%. In the more affluent regions, the shift was more towards equal concern than to state aid. And what we said last year, I, I'd forgotten we wrote this in last year's report, was the tax cap raises the stakes over state aid for all districts, whether they're rich or poor. You know, one way to, to address problems with the tax cap is by getting more state aid. And that's borne out by this result. Uh, some other things from the uh, survey that will from the report, we do ask about percentages of, uh, uh, about specific budget actions taken each of the last three years. Uh, we do see increase in percentage of districts getting concessions from teacher unions, for example. Uh, the impact of the current year budget on individual programs and services, <coughs> tax cap, cost impact of APPR, so forth, priorities for mandated relief, not surprising, prior leads the way. Uh, priorities for uses of new revenue, something that emerges from this, this survey is concerned about what's happening with our ability to provide extra help for kids who need it. Last year and this year, that was the top priority of new funding became available. We do break, can break down some results by region or uh, district type, and again, we're aiming to release the report uh, next week. So that's, uh, that's my part. educated in the best fashion we can and uh, we've been kind of leading a charge at least in our region we have over 400 school districts we only have one in Long Island uh, but probably uh, north of uh, West just into Sullivan County all the way through to north to Canada west to Canada across the entire southern part of the state is our membership 
Now, we kind of pride ourselves on letting the data do the talking for us. I basically explained the data because it appears that we have a couple hundred people who are running the state that really don't understand the data. And they have never analyzed the data, and they've never looked at the data, and we're not shy about the data. And I think the data reveals exactly where things are going for all of us. Because, believe it or not, we're all in the same boat. And one of the big challenges I have is, uh, as the SSFC Executive Director is making sure our members understand that the district, that we, districts we represent are not monolithic. And I think what, one of the other challenges I have is to make sure that they understand that the southern, the northern suburbs of New York City, as well as Long Island, is not monolithic. That we have rich and poor, we have high poverty uh, belts, we have low and high income, and the diversification is just as diversified in the southern portion of the state as it is in the upper portion. There are a number of politicians and others who have tried exhaustively to make this an upstate versus downstate issue. And we've tried exhaustively to explain to them that it really isn't. It's really a have versus have not issue. It has nothing to do with upstate versus downstate. Now downstate seems to have a few more wealthier districts than upstate, but nevertheless, there are huge similarities throughout the entire state with regard to these school districts. So let's have the data do the talking. <clears throat> we have workshops, we have actually four workshops a year. We have a couple hundred uh, school district superintendents come to each one of them. And we actually instruct them on what's going on with their district. Now you have copies of handouts, I think, at your table, uh, which might be easier to read from a distance than this, but let me just go through this with you. Uh, this is actually the change in, prop, in the uh, budgets between last year and into this current year based on CWR. So as I always do, I try and explain just about everything we've got covered because not everybody is into the technicalities. But we've got the CWR on the bottom of the graph going from zero to eight. Now if you'll notice in the red box, technically speaking, our, our, our districts are all in the red box, every one. And that usually covers CWR to 1.4. All of our districts are usually 1.4 and below in CWR. Combined wealth ratio, that's the combination of property values and income. And we just go to eight. Now, I, actually, you know, the numbers go as high as 44.96. But we stop at eight because after eight, it actually all looks the same. There's just a few districts out there. So we just stop at eight. But what it does show, this graph clearly shows, is that a number of districts, a large number of districts, actually lowered their budgets coming into this year because probably because of the tax cap and probably because of the lack of resources. So they lowered their budget. But more importantly, this next slide shows that they, despite lowering their budgets, they actually increased their levies. So to us, we start saying, well, wait a minute, what's going on? How can you, wouldn't you lower your budget, you lower your levy? And what we find out is the districts that are struggling the most, no matter where they are in the state, they're forced to lower their budgets, opportunities for children, and still ask for an increase in the levy. And why is this? It's all because of the money they're getting, basically, we believe, from state aid and a number of other factors. And I think Bob pointed out in his piece that TRS, growing TRS piece is going to be really troublesome. And that's been going on for years. So we're a little mystified by this whole thing. We start saying, well, how can you, if you compare the two graphs, these are the same districts. All of our statewide data includes everybody in the state. So everybody in this room are in these data sets. All of our data. I remember one time someone said to me, well, we're looking at your data, but it has nothing to do with us. I said, how is that possible? Well, you just do your membership. We have never just done our membership. <laughs> we have always included every single district in the state. So automatically, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out this is going to be an ongoing problem. Because I believe people are going to start cutting their budgets again this year and still ask for a levy increase. Because we're going to have some real issues. Now this is another graph we show. And everybody in this room is in the red box, except for maybe two districts. And this is the entire state. And again, I go up to eight. Now what is this? What this is, is this is telling me why they cut their budgets. And this is because, mostly because of the GDA, this gap elimination adjustment, these cuts. This is what this graph means. If you had to absorb the total GDA, dollar for dollar, in your district, what would you have to cut your budget to absorb it? 
Well, clearly, as you can see, there are some districts down here would have to go 10.75% cut out of their entire budget. And if you notice, there's a curve to this graph. And the wealthiest districts based on CWR actually have to cut the least. And what we have seen over the years is this is a reoccurring theme. Now, please note the date. This is 11-12 school year. Now, I'm going to zip you ahead to the 12-13 school year. I'm going to make a little cartoon out of it. Last year, this year, last year, this year, last year, this year. And you can see what has actually happened, as Bob kind of revealed here today, is that the distribution of the reduction of the GEA, or restoration of GEA, however you want to call it, has actually been more progressive. So we saw a diminishment of the bottom end of the curve. Yet, the curve remains because it was so little money put into this piece. So it was definitely a help. Now, how did they, where did they come up with this idea? Well, I'm sure your organization, I know we did. We actually supplied the state, the governor, legislators with data on how to actually do this. We were a little surprised they hadn't figured it out on their own. So what we did is we actually came up with this data that allowed this, this, excuse me, this to move to this. But here is the part of the state that is not our membership. If you'll notice, let's just take a look at the curves. This is everybody, this is not our members. This is everybody, this is not our members. The curves are identical. And the people with the lowest CWRs lose the most. The impact on their budget is the greatest. And this is refit. These are the member districts in the room. You are in the red box, except for a couple districts. Here's non-members. Here's everybody, non-members, here you are. You see, actually, believe it or not, I think we're all on the same team. This is not an upstate, downstate issue. This is not someone pounding Long Island. Long Island is not monolithic. Long Island districts, these districts, your districts, your membership, is getting the same bad deal as everyone else. So believe it or not, we're really on the same mission. But you know, that's just the budget. Let's talk about the levy, because it's the levy that the taxpayers see. So this is the 10, 11, uh, uh, 2011, 12, uh, 11. And what this means is, if you were to take that GEA, what would you have to increase taxes in order to cover the loss of funds in the GEA? This is the entire state up to 0.8 CWR. And if you'll notice, the curve is actually reversed again, but it's the same kind of trend. The poorest among us in the red box, and most of you are in the red box, you would have to pay the most. And the people with the highest CWRs pay the least. This is going to be a problem. So look what happened this year. You'll notice the curve is still there, but it's diminished. Last year, this year. Last year, this year. So the impact is less, but it's still pretty high. Following along, these are our non-member districts. You'll notice the same curve. The impact isn't as large. Don't forget, we've got a lot of small rural schools with small numbers of kids, so the impact of our, our, our levies are a lot smaller. And here is refit. You're still in the red box with us. The dilemma is, is how long are we going to keep this up? How long are we going to let people artificially create a divide between us? Because there really isn't one and there shouldn't be one. We are really on the same mission. But here's the interesting thing. If you start looking at the same data, you'll see that, technically speaking, budget spending went up 1.7% on average. 1.7% on average. So everybody's trying to hold the fort. I'm wondering with the ERS and TRS and the uh, medical insurance issues that we've got, if we're going to be able to hold that 1.7. But don't forget the 1.7 is an average. And I'll give you the Rick Tim's definition of average. My head is in the oven, my feet are in the freezer, and on average I feel just fine. <laughs> I just showed you a graph earlier of over 100 school districts that actually decreased their budgets. But the average is still an increase. And that's because some of these cost drivers are really hurt. They're hurting bad. But enrollment's going down. It's going down at different amounts across the state. But let's take a look at some other data. 
This data actually reveals, look at the number in the red, $112,900,000. I call that money left on the table. As an ex-superintendent, I say to myself, gee, what happened there? You know what that is? That's off a spreadsheet from the property tax report card. And what I did is I actually, we calculated in the real property tax report card how much money you were allowed to levy, counting your exemptions, versus how much you actually did levy. Because don't forget, everybody was trying to get to this, quote, 2%. Well, actually, what happened was school districts were allowed to actually levy a tax without a supermajority, 100 and almost 13 million dollars higher than they did. Districts across the state, no matter where you were in the state, chose to absorb these costs. For instance, let's just say if you if you had a capital project four years ago and you voted on it. When you voted on it, the, the public basically promised to pay for it in their levy. Well, by leaving this money on the table, of which a huge portion of it is capital expense, you've just told them, please, don't pay for it. We'll pay for it. We'll cut something, or we'll use fund balance to cover it. You can't keep this up in perpetuity. But you know, that's a net. What does a net mean? A net means that some people actually took their exemptions and more and went for it, the supermajority, and actually got it. So let's take those people out and see what happens. We take out the people that added to their exemptions away, we find out that the real figure is closer to almost $139 million left on the table. That hypothetically, school districts will have to absorb forever. Now how did we do that? Well, we did one or more of three things. We either cut program, we cut staff, or we used fund balance. So, how many times can you cut the same program? Once. Same staff member? Once. Well, let's talk about the fund balances then. There's something known as the restricted reserves, restricted fund balance, the reserves we used to call them. Capital reserve, EBLAR reserve, reserve for certiori, unemployment reserve, right, ERS reserve. Across the state, we jettisoned $286 million worth of reserves. Now, if those reserves were legitimate, and they were for legitimate liabilities, that means what we have done is use the money we had saved for a liability, and we've spent it to live now, or to decrease the rate of increase of taxes now. So if you have a tax cert claim for a million bucks, and you took money out of that reserve to go balance your budget, you do not all of a sudden not have that tax certiorari claim. Sooner or later, that's going to show up. Somebody said, well, I had to use that money to balance my budget. So when that claim comes up, what are you going to have to do? Well, what you're going to have to do is go borrow the money. Now think about this. You could have had the money, but you decide to borrow it. So you're going to hire someone to go get the money for you, and then you're going to pay interest on the money. And where's that cost going to go? Well, some people would say to the taxpayer, where's where it will legitimately go? I'm thinking maybe not, because here's what's going to happen. It'll simply be added to your budget, and you will use more fund balance cut more programs or more staff to balance the budgeting because now you have an additional cost. I see it as a very slippery slope. How about that appropriated fund balance? $115 million less than appropriated fund balance. Well, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is I just got through showing you a chart saying that a lot of people lowered their budget. So therefore, they didn't need as much appropriated fund balance. They're trying to take the pressure off the appropriated fund balance. Well, interestingly, there's other reasons too. They don't have any money to put in the appropriated fund balance. Remember where the appropriated fund balance usually comes from. It comes from the delta between revenues and expenditures. So let's just say you thought you were going to get $10 million in revenues in, but you get 11. Well, you got a million dollars now in cash. Say you thought you were going to spend $10 million, but you only spent nine. Now you got another million. If your appropriated fund balance was $2 million, <coughs> you're good. The big problem is, in the next budget year, will two million be enough to close the gap? Let's take a look at the next piece. This is the unrestricted. This is the cash on hand. This is what keeps your cash flow going. This is what pays people every two weeks. This is what buys the materials and supplies and contractual expenses for your district. Almost $200 million went out the door. You start adding this all up, You've got a good chunk of change. We are hemorrhaging money. 
not my membership, all of us. It's not a geographic issue. It's actually a political issue. Because there's supposed to be people who I thought, as an ex-social studies teacher, were supposed to help us and protect us. And that's the rubber. We will work with legislators, but we don't feel we're bound to support bad behavior. And the bad behavior is not helping anyone out. So technically speaking, definition of average, head in the freezer, feed in the oven, on average, we spent more in total, we spent more per student, we collected more taxes, we lost more reserves, we lost more appropriated fund balance, we lost more cash on hand, and we lost more students. This is not a formula for success, and I believe distribution is part of the problem. That's why those curves existed in the previous graphs I've shown you. So what I did is I said, I said okay, well how much foundation aid that supposedly frozen, although it moved about $112 million this year, how much of that it's got to come forward. Don't you remember we were paid 37.5% and then it was frozen for a couple years? Remember that? Well, I started looking it up. If we keep improving foundation aid by $112 million a year, in only 50 years, in only 50 years, we will actually have the foundation aid due to us in the 2010-11 school year. <laughs> if these people help us anymore, I'm going to start to cry. <laughs> and of course, I don't cry, which is going to be part of the problem for them. Also, foundation aid, they reduced the foundation, or excuse me, the GEA, they reduced the GEA. I've calculated that it only takes six years to get rid of all the GEA. So all you have to do with us is survive 50 years for foundation aid and six years for the GEA to go away, and you're all set. I think it's time we band together and start saying this is totally unacceptable and we're not taking it anymore. Now we've been actually saying this for years and we would welcome some allies. But the truth of it is, is we will continue this battle no matter what. So here you are in refit. This is the refit districts and here's a quick graph. And this is the data right off the, the state aid website. Matter of fact, what I've done is I've actually used the titles in many of them right off the spreadsheet. Somebody says, well, he must be making this stuff up. He's trying to be divisive. This is the data. All the senators and assembly people, SED, the governor, and even my mom have access to this data. <laughs> so what actually happens here is we look at, there's your combined wealth ratios, there's your reduced free and reduced lunch, there's the foundation aid you got, there's the, uh, the next one in green is the foundation aid before phase in. This is the foundation aid that is due to you. Do you know that this adds up to $5.5 billion? Well, where is it? Well, here's the thing. So what I did is I simply said, well, how much is due to you? And then how much have you got to go before you're there? Well, if you look at the uh, second count over from the right, you'll see there's, let's just start off with the first district. You say, so 109%. Did you know if you live there, I, I hate to tell you if you're the superintendent, business official, or board member, Right now, according to the formula, you are overfunded by $2,122,000. You're overfunded. They gave you too much aid. Because here's what's happened. They froze your aid statute at the amount you got in the previous year. But what happened is the inputs into the formula keep coming. Your enrollment has changed. Your, your uh, property wealth has changed. Your income wealth has changed. All these metrics have changed. They kept updating the formula within the spreadsheets. So it comes to pass that three districts in the room have got all the money, according to the formula, that they absolutely need forever. And the rest of you just have to wait, most of you, if you look down at the bottom, 58 years. Remember I told you the average was 50? It is. How do you like average now? It doesn't look so good. You would probably rather be average, some of you. So things aren't going well. Do you notice there's nobody on, the gra on this chart that is at 37.5% by the way? Nobody, but there's more. What we actually have here is the uh, GEA going away. Now if you'll notice, I have actually divided this one by, I sorted it by CWR. So the districts are now listed from, from uh, in CWR. So if you take a look at the CWR category, 
you will see that um, what I've actually done is listed you. I think your CWR is second from the right. There it is over there. So it's from low to high. And if you'll notice, look at the column next to the CWR, the years at this rate when your GEA will end. And I think you will notice, that technically speaking, you would think if you were going to if there was a correlation between your wealth and the GEA, the numbers under years, the GEA fully funded, would be from low to high. You'll notice that they are not. And that's because the formula is really a, way, is a mechanism to actually move things around in the state regardless of how wealthy you are or you aren't. This masquerade has been going on for years and it continues. But then I sorted it again just for kicks. Based on triple, let's do it by poverty. And if you'll notice, again, we don't have a sequence. And that's because poverty doesn't play a large part in it. But I've got to tell you, the governor's run with the reduction of the GEA had a high poverty piece. I did a, a Pearson motion correlation for those of you who love statistics that his run to diminish the GEA for Fripple counts was a 0.8, which means it was highly correlated to poverty. But interestingly enough, the legislature didn't like the distribution statewide, put money into Foundation A, put money into GEA, and recalculated what we would call the shares agreement, and we lost the correlation down to 0.69. So actually, the governor's run was more progressive and helped many of you in the room more than the legislature's run, even though the legislature added more money. So let's just take a look at it. Bob kind of alluded to this, and here's all the age kind of lined up. And what we've got is the foundation age. You can see how it was frozen in 10, 11, and uh, 11, 12, and then it increased by about 100 and uh, 11.5 million, and there was the change. And we've got all this pictured out here, and we've got it all in here. But you know, a lot of people forget those federal offsets. We had a lot of federal offsets. So we see the federal offset to the, in the GEA, the Federal Jobs Fund. Uh, a lot of people forget we got $1.3 billion. We would have had more unemployment, we would have lost more program and used more fund balance had it not been for the federal offsets. And that sequestration thing Bob talked about is very important. How much is that in New York State? In the current year, it's $268 million. We lose that federal funds, believe me, we will be lowering budgets, and we will be letting off staff, and using more fund balance, and we will be cutting programs like crazy. Now, interestingly enough, let's just take a look at it. You'll see as it goes down, the, the line, the second, second column over from the right, you'll see it adds up to $665 billion. This is my projection into next year if we had the 3.5% uh, personal income tax base. And that's what was predicted in the budget. Because here's what happens. Everybody thinks we got 4.1% last year. Well, we did 805 million. It never showed up to us. All you got was 752 million. You got 93.4%. Why? Because they shoved some of it off to the performance <coughs> grants, teacher centers, and other pet projects. So there's already, already the skimming off the top before you even get it. Then they subtract your expense-driven aids for building aid, students with disability, public and private excess cost aid, transportation aid, both these aid are cut off the top, and the money left is for your regular aid. That's what's happening to you. Very clever. Well, this is how I believe it will work out. I put in $245 million for expense-driven aids. That leaves only $420 million for any reduction in the GEA, which is less than you, basically this year you got $400 million. <coughs> But I put nothing in for foundation aid because I'm worried about foundation aid. A lot of people say fully fund foundation aid. I say not so fast. One is we believe something in the formula should be changed. The income portionality in the formula should be changed, and we think that would help. But what I'm worried about is those districts that are, quote, overpaid. Those districts that are overpaid in foundation aid. Why would we send more districts? Because foundation aid was supposed to eliminate save harmless. Everybody remember that term? Save harmless. This is where, by a formula, you've got too much money, so we have to keep paying you the money. Well, if I add up all those overpayments throughout the state, what do I find? I find we've overpaid $124 million. So if we keep adding money to Foundation Aid, what will we continue to do? Keep overpaying. But interestingly enough, some of those folks are poor and some of them are wealthy. 
So the formula does not work. It simply does not work. There's 138 districts overpaid. 71 of them have CWRs in excess of 1.4. So we have a problem. Our legislature and government has created Safe Harmless out of the formula that was created to eliminate Safe Harmless. This is like a modern miracle. <laughs> And this is why I get in trouble, because I say these things. I think we have to speak the truth, the power. We can't be railroaded by this anymore, but there's more good news. As Bob pointed out, it looks like the 3.5 might not show up. The 3 might show up. And if you look, as I kind of prognosticated to the future, you'll see that now we're talking maybe 325 million, maybe, for the GEA which is less. So here you're going to go build a budget based on these new health insurance and TRS and ERS costs and salary costs and steps and all the rest of it. And at the same time, the amount of increase in state aid you're going to get is diminished. This is going to be a problem. At what point do we say, stop, enough is enough? Now, I know we've been characterized as the Robin Hood group, but we're not into Robin Hood. We don't want to take any money from anyone else. They've got to relook at this thing and if now they've created $124 million to save farmers, they're going to have to pay these people. You cannot take money away, I don't think. We've never advocated that. We've said you've got to put more money in this because you promised to put more money in this. You promised this would be fair and equitable. It is not, clearly. So here's what we're suggesting. We're suggesting that you get rid of the GDA as fast as possible because it hurts you and us more than it hurts anyone else. The GDA is more destructive than the actual implementation of the foundation aid formula. The foundation aid formula is inequitable, its distribution is unacceptable, but the GEA is worse. And it's a huge amount of money and it's an easier lift. It's only 2.2 billion, rather than coming up with 5.5 billion for the foundation aid. Basically, you know, we could all be made whole back to 2010-11 if the state would only come up with, say, I don't know, $8 billion. But as Bob showed you, based on their deficits they're looking at, that's not going to happen. So what would be the greatest area we would get the best justice of? What would be the most fair? It would be the GEA. But what we're saying is, look, the GEA should have two parts. If you're going to start giving people money back, you've got to do it on two pieces. And it would help you as much as it would help anyone else. Because technically, we're battling for everybody who has a low CWR, 1.4 or less, or 1.5 or less and has high triple counts. What we're saying is take that GEA formula, and if there's like, say, let's make it up, $300 million, take $150 million and use it, and send most of it, get that curve going so that the lowest CWR people get the most, and the higher triple people get the most too. Those two measures, fiscal capacity and power. We're also saying remove any and all money for non-essential programs. Look, I love teacher centers. I was a teacher for a long time. I was union president. I've had every job. Matter of fact, probably I can't keep a job. Probably. But the key thing is, is this. Our BOCES provide staff development, so is the teacher center. If the BOCES staff development is no good, then can we get rid of it and put the teacher center in its place? If the teacher center is not as good as the BOCES one, let's get rid of the teacher center and get the BOCES. We can't fund both. This is getting silly. I don't want to upset the people at NYSERC, but they're going to have to get over it. You know why? Because the kids in our districts, yours and mine, need an education. And trying to keep two or three people employed doing staff development when we can just consolidate these things is crazy. Also, this performance grant business. I don't want to put another penny into performance grants. We need the money to survive. Performance grants. Okay, so they gave $50 million away. Does anybody tell me how we're doing with those? Anybody? How good are they? Can you show me a lot of progress? Can you tell me it was worth $50 million? Well, how about we don't put any more money into it until somebody can figure that out? We're investing in the wrong thing. We have to invest in our children. The other thing I think we've got to point out is that we've got to avoid temptation to divert money for political purposes. Bullet aid is one. You mean to tell me that after the state told us, I had my legislator tell me, we are broke, Rick. Give me a break. You're riding me like a horse. Give me, give me a, some breathing room. We're broke. 
After all these districts went and cut the staff, used their fund balances up, decreased their budgets, eliminated programs for kids, a month later, the legislature fines $41 million and then distributes it. So if you have a Democratic Assembly person or you have a, a, a Republican senator, you got some money. I mean, give me a break. And I'm calling them out. And they are not happy with me. But I don't care. I want our children to get everything they're supposed to get. This isn't supposed to be a circus. Then I think we put down here, we've got to uh, repurpose the commission. I am not hopeful about this, this New York commission. Some of these hearings have six to 10 of the commission members there. 